Fellow Singaporeans, good evening. We have had a good year overall. Our economy is doing quite well. It is growing steadily. Productivity has improved and wages have gone up. Thank you, all of you, for the hard work and the good results. Over the last few months, I attended the 50th anniversaries of the JTC, Keppel, and DBS. They are all celebrating Golden Jubilees this year. Fifty years ago, which was 1968, it was a critical year in our nation building. Singapore was newly independent. There was much to do, and we were not yet on a stable footing. The British announced unexpectedly that they would withdraw their forces from Singapore by 1971. That was earlier than planned. That was a severe blow to us. At the time, our businesses and workers depended on British forces, which contributed more than 20% of our GDP then. Besides, we had just started national service and did not yet have a strong SAF. The new recruits were just in the forces. Only then, our livelihood and security were thus at risk. The then finance minister was Dr. Go King Sui. He crafted policies to maintain the confidence of Singaporeans and investors and to reassure our people about their jobs and livelihood. He set up several new companies and agencies, including the JTC, Keppel and DBS, which I mentioned, and that promoted industrialization and we created many jobs, which brought down the unemployment rate, which was as high as 7%. Those were tough times, but fortunately, Singaporeans and the government came together with grit and resilience. Compared to those early years, Singapore now has been totally transformed and our lives have improved significantly. We now have a world-class education system, we enjoy affordable and high-quality health care, and we also have a high rate of home ownership. With a more mature economy, our growth rate has slowed, but we continue to grow steadily. Unemployment remains low and wages continue to rise. The fruits of economic growth are being shared among our people through various government measures. However, people still feel cost of living pressures. They sense that they have to spend more and that their earnings never seem to be quite enough. Why do people feel that way? I think there are four main reasons why Singaporeans are feeling cost of living pressures. Let me explain. First, let's look at the concerns of young families. They are buying their first flats. They are also planning to start families, have children, and they want to provide the best start for them. Therefore, these young families pay close attention to the costs of housing and preschool education. Young families pay attention to housing and preschool education costs. Second, there is the sandwiched generation looking after their children and their parents both the young and the old. With an aging population, more families will be in this situation, and already more families are in this situation now. What do they worry about? They worry about medical expenses because their parents are getting old and will have more medical conditions than need medical attention for. They are also worried about the costs of education as their children are still young. Therefore, the sandwiched generation is concerned about health care and education costs. So that's the second point. The third point is that our lifestyles have changed. 
Over the years, as the economy has grown and technology has progressed, our quality of life has also improved. Things that were once considered luxury items before, or perhaps didn't, didn't even exist before, like mobile phones, have now become daily necessities. People also eat out more and also have more entertainment and leisure options. Going on vacations overseas has also become more common. Travel fairs are always packed with crowds, and there are more than one fair per year. Currently, there is one travel fair going on as, even as we speak. Our standard of living has gone up. That is a good thing because it means that our lives have improved. However, to sustain this higher quality of life, people are spending more than before, and that can put pressure on them. So the cost of living, which is the third point, can increase as a result of changing lifestyles. Lastly, inflation has led to price increases. According to statistics, the overall price increase is relatively modest, and overall, wages have gone up. We have done better than most or many developed countries. However, I know not everyone's wages grew. For some, wages have stagnated. Others worry about losing their jobs because of economic restructuring. Some have lost their jobs, but they are the minority, fortunately. And retirees who are living off their savings are worried about their savings running out. Therefore, for these Singaporeans, when prices increase, any kind of increase, no matter how small or big, they feel as if their wallets have shrunk. In summary, there are four key reasons why people feel the cost of living is exerting pressure on them. The concerns of young families, the concerns of the sandwich generation, lifestyle changes, and price increases. The major expenditure items which Singaporeans are most concerned about are housing, health care, and education. Thus, the government has been looking at these three things very closely. We will make sure that HDB housing, health care and education are affordable so that Singaporeans do not have to worry about them. I have spoken about education many times in previous National Day rallies. This year, in my English speech later, I will be speaking about health care and public housing and the adjustments the government will make to better meet the needs of Singaporeans. In my Chinese speech, I am focusing on price increases and lifestyle changes. I will explain what the government can do as well as what you can do to alleviate cost of living pressures. First, let me talk about price increases. The government has tried to keep inflation low and prices stable, but we cannot completely prevent prices from increasing. For example, recently, water prices have gone up. This is the first time in nearly 20 years that water prices have increased, last year and this year, because the increase is taking place over two years. We put off the increase for as long as we could, but in the end we had to do it because the cost of producing clean water has increased significantly over the years. We also need to build more new water factories and desalination plants to produce more of our own water in Singapore, and these call for substantial investments. Water will always be a precious resource for us, a strategic and security issue, as well as a sensitive foreign policy matter. That was the case 53 years ago. That is still the case today, 53 years later. And if you read the newspapers recently about news in our region, you would know that our vital interests, where water is concerned, have not changed. 
This is the issue to do with water prices. As for electricity tariffs, electricity tariffs have also increased this year, but this is a more complicated issue which needs a longer explanation. Let me first do a simple quiz. Do you think that today's electricity tariff has gone up or down compared to 10 years ago? Let me ask one more time. Do you think that today's electricity tariff has gone up or down compared to 10 years ago? What's your instinctive reaction? If you think that today's electricity tariff is higher than what it was 10 years ago, please raise your hands. No one dares to raise his hand or her hand. Surely someone is willing or bold enough to raise the hand. If you think that today's electricity tariff is lower than what it was 10 years ago, please raise your hands. Lower. Not many people has raised his or her hand. Let us look at the data. Let's look at this chart. The horizontal axis indicates the years from 2008 to 2018. And the vertical axis indicates the electricity tariffs. Ten years ago, in the third quarter of 2008, the electricity tariff was 25.07 cents per kilowatt hour, which was slightly more than 25 cents. Since then, the tariff has gone up and down over the years. And today, how much is it? You can check this online. It is 23.65 cents per kilowatt hour, less than 24 cents per kilowatt hour. So the answer is this. Today's tariff is lower compared to 10 years ago. Give yourself a clap if you got it right. Why did some people think that electricity is getting more and more expensive? I think one possible reason is that when electricity prices go up, people remember vividly. Unfortunately, when the tariff comes down, we may not notice it or we just simply forget rather quickly. And this issue has become a political issue. Electricity tariffs really is not something or are not something that the government can control because we generate most of our electricity using natural gas and we import all of our natural gas. The prices of natural gas are packed to global oil prices. Thus, we adjust electricity bills according to movements in oil prices. Let me show you another chart. The horizontal axis, again, indicates the years from 2008 to 2018, and the vertical axis indicates oil prices. Let us look at electricity tariffs and oil prices in the last 10 years. Again, up and down. You can see that our electricity tariffs track changes in oil prices. That's because about half of our electricity costs come from oil which means that electricity tariffs have a lot to do with oil prices. Some people would still ask, why should electricity tariffs be in step with oil price fluctuations? Why can't the government fix the electricity tariff? There are two reasons why we can't. First, we are not an oil-producing country, and we do not produce natural gas. Fixing electricity tariffs that way will mean costly subsidies that is not financially sustainable in the long run. Secondly, if we do that, it means those who consume more electricity will receive more subsidy. Who do you think uses more electricity, the wealthy or the low income? It is the wealthy. Subsidizing the cost of electricity by fixing a low tariff is not the best way to help local or low-income families. A more effective way is to give direct subsidies. These direct subsidies are for low to middle income families and they're used for their utility bills. That is what the government has been doing. All households living in HDB flats are 
entitled to U-Save rebates. Households living in smaller flats receive the most U-Save rebates. Those living in bigger flats also receive U-Save rebates, but the rebates are lower. Last year, we also increased the U-Save rebates. Households in one- and two-room HDB flats will receive close to $400 of U-Save rebates this year. That is about four months' worth of utility bills. In other words, for every 12 months, four of them have been paid for by the government, according to that. It's up to one-third, if you think about it. So you can't really say the government is stingy about this. I have spent some time today explaining water prices, oil prices, and you save rebates and the relationship among them. I hope that people will understand that we have adopted the best approach to lessen the burden of Singaporeans. While the government will do its part to alleviate the people's cost of living concerns, each and every one of us also has a responsibility to look after our own wallets, save water, save electricity, and at the same time, shop around for the best prices and be a smart consumer. I will now talk about lifestyle changes. I will be using three examples, mobile phones, infant milk formula, and hawker centers. Mobile phones, first of all. Mobile phones have completely changed our lifestyles and how we communicate. In the 1990s, most Singaporean families only had one landline. Everyone in the family took turns to use the phone, no matter how big the family was. The telecommunications bill was lower than about $8 a month or $100 a year or so. Today, most households no longer have landlines. That is because almost all family members, young and old, grandparents and even, even young children, whom I will show you later, now have mobile phones, and they are mostly smartphones, I would think. Every phone comes with a data plan, even. Mobile phones have become a necessity in our daily lives. Without them, we can't serve the internet, receive information, or contact our friends. We would feel cut off from the world without them, and our lives would become so-called unbearable. This is the way forward to become a smart nation. We should not regress. However, in the way forward, that also means telecommunications bills will grow. That is understandable. However, it is still a burden, nevertheless. The CDAC found that some low-income families had telecommunications bills as much as $300 or more. That is more than 10% of their household incomes. <coughs> but there are also other families whose telecommunications bills only come up to $100, and yet they can meet their needs. I am glad that the CDAC has been giving households financial advice through, through such workshops and suggesting ways to bring down their telecommunications bills. For example, if you want to watch a drama serial or a movie online, please do not use 4G. Just wait till you get home, where you can download the films using your home Wi-Fi. And then, when you're out, you can try to use wireless at SG for free as much as possible. That can help to lower the amount of data you use. If we watch our data usage, we will not have to worry about high telecommunications bills. We can still serve the internet, connect with friends, and video chat with our children and grandchildren. My next example is something which is of great concern to the young parents, that is the prices of the infant formula. Compared to other countries, infant formula in Singapore is more expensive. I can understand that every parent wants to have the best for their children, 
And to be honest, all the grandparents are just the same. Now I know. To the baby, breast milk, of course, is the best. But there were more and more young mothers are working, and it's not uh, convenient for them to feed the uh, uh, child and maybe not enough breast milk, so they have to supplement it with infant formula. So the infant formula makers have taken advantage of this to develop all sorts of premium brands. They have also marketed aggressively, misleading parents into thinking that it is more expensive, it must be better. So parents say, well, we must buy the best, otherwise uh, it's not. we can't give the best to the children. So parents spare no expenses and tend to buy the expensive brands for the children. So the government set up a task force led by Senior Minister of State, Dr. Kobo Kun, to tackle this problem. So he's a gentleman, but he's a doctor, so I think he's qualified to do this. So the task force addressed the issue in various ways. First, government simplified import processes and brought in more brands and parallel imports. Hospitals have also come on board. Now public hospitals are offering more affordable brands so that the newborns will not get used to drinking expensive brands of infant formula, because once you are used to it, it's very difficult for them to change the brand of uh, uh, infant formula. Some private com hospitals are also adopting this approach, and we encourage them to do so. The government has also indicated clearly that it will tighten regulations for the labelling of infant formula and put a stop to misleading advertising. What a mis misleading advertisement. In the past, there were many advertisements showing some lovely babies of some cute animals uh, wearing the motorboards, uh, very impressive, as if drinking that particular brand, the baby will become smarter. I'm glad that there are not so many of these advertisements, not totally eliminated, but I think that they are much lesser now. I think the formula makers realize that government is determined to solve this problem. At the same time, the task force launched a campaign to educate parents that more expensive infant formula is not necessarily better unless a child has a special medical requirement. Otherwise, all infant formula sold in Singapore are suitable for our children and will meet their nutritional needs. My generation, when we were infants, there were no such expensive brands of infant milk, yet we grow so strong and healthy. So I believe, I'm so confident that the next generation will not have a problem. Through our efforts, there are now more reasonably priced options for consumers to choose from. Average prices of formula milk have dropped. More importantly, young parents are better informed. They are now able to make better choices based on their needs and budget. Therefore, they can save money, reduce the cost of living, and feel less under pressure. Of course, not every household needs to buy infant formula, but everybody needs to eat. So my third example is on hawker's food. Nowadays, there are fewer families that cook at home because there are more dual-income families these days. They have no time to cook after working the whole day and it is more convenient for them to eat out. This lifestyle change is completely understandable. But eating out costs more than cooking at home, so it pushes up the cost of living. And one way to help Singaporeans manage the cost of eating out is to build more hawker centres. In the past few years, government has built seven new centres and 13 more are on the way. Stores in the new hawker centres are required to provide affordable food choices. Every store must 
assure that there will be at least one meal option which is priced at $3 or less. In other words, when we tender out the hawker centres, we do not access bids just on their tender price alone, but also on whether the operators can afford affordable options. For example, you can get affordable and delicious chicken rice at our old Tampanese hub, and you can see they're actually halal, so everybody can eat. Tonight, I have invited the uh, chicken rice store holder and eight other hawker stalls from all over Singapore uh, at our reception tonight. This is um, providing a proper uh, advertisement. So at the end of this National Day Rally, you can taste their food and hope you will like it. Hawker centres are important not just to keep the cost of living low, they are also a cultural institution, a unique part of Singapore's heritage and identity. Hawker centres are our community dining room. Singaporeans of all races, Chinese, Malay, Indian, Eurasians, and of all religious faith and income groups, they are able to eat together in hawker centres, and here, you can enjoy nasi lemak, char kway tiao, and roti prata as such a local delicacies. And of course, I hope that you remember last year at our National Days Rally, what we discussed to eat as far as possible, choose healthier options like soto ayam, yong tau hu, or tose. Singaporeans who are staying overseas, they always crave for local hawker food. When we host Singapore Days overseas, the hawker food is the biggest draw for homesick Singaporeans. You can see that hawker food is the best cure for homesickness for Singaporeans. So, our hawker centres and hawker food resonate with many Singaporeans. Medical Channel 8's uh, Tuesday Report has a popular series of documentaries where we connect, introducing hawker culture. It's very popular. And from here, there are many touching stories, and they happen at the hawker centres which are familiar to us. Let us take a look. Ciao 慈源小贩中心的不同在于它以社会企业形式经营每个摊位必须售卖至少两道价格低于两块八的食物让主要的顾客群也就是附近的祖屋居民负担得起from the clip, you can see that our hawker center, uh, our hawker's culture, is a part of our community. It is also our collective memories and also 
good in creating our sense of belonging to the nation. Three years ago, the Singapore Botanic Gardens was inscribed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. This was a proud moment for Singaporeans because this is the first time and also the only UNESCO World Heritage Site that we have. Now we have decided to apply for a second UNESCO inscription, and this time is on hawker culture. We want to apply and nominate our hawker's culture to be inscribed on the UNESCO representative list of the intangible cultural heritage of humanity. In our various consultations, there was a widespread support from Singaporeans to nominate our hawker's culture because it is uniquely Singapore and it reflects our daily lives. If this is successful, it will help to safeguard and promote this unique culture for future generations. It will also let the rest of the world know about our local food and our very unique multicultural heritage. So I hope that everybody will strongly support this nomination so that our hawker culture can stand proudly on the world stage. <laughs> I spoke about our early years and economic journey, how our standards of living have improved, and how the government is working with you to cope with the cost of living pressures. But a nation cannot just be pursuing economic growth and material achievements. What holds us together are the intangibles, our values, our shared memories, and our collective sense of mission. This year's National Day Parade featured five individuals who shared with us their life experiences. They led difficult and frugal lives, but they were optimistic and driven, and they care about the communities. One of them was Madam Wu yun an 88-year-old Samsa woman, she came to Southeast Asia to earn a living and you know, that she would be able to lead better lives. She and her fellow Samsu sisters worked very hard at the construction sites. She witnessed the dramatic transformation of Singapore and she's proud of what we have become. Her touching life story moved many people, including me. Let's hear what she said. I became a breadwinner at 15 years old. My family depended on me. My Samsu sisters look after me. Our lives then were very difficult. Change is important. I will still say that times are better now. Now in Singapore, we live well. We eat well, our children go to school, we are healthy, good health, no illness or pain, have rice, we eat rice, have porridge, we eat porridge. Have rice, eat rice, have porridge, eat porridge, right? So this respectable elderly woman and reminded us that we have to be optimistic and we should have a happy life. So 53 years ago, Singapore was almost have nothing. She and the pioneer generation toyed and built Singapore from scratch. The generations who followed them built on the foundations that the pioneers laid. They too have worked hard so that we can have better lives now that we're in a stronger position to realize bigger dreams and scale new heights. Today, it is our generation's turn to build Singapore, and we too must be resolute and open new frontiers so that our children and grandchildren will have an even better future. This is how we keep Singapore going 
generation after generation, so that Singapore will always remain an exceptional country that stands tall in the world and an endearing home for all of us. Thank you, everybody.